So we're on now. So our first speakers of the day are Katie and uh, Josu. So take it away whenever you're ready, guys. Yep. Okay, good morning, everyone. So we are going to be talking about initial conditions for inflation and in particular also how we use our called DR Tombo to solve these problems. So the first part of the talk, the first 10 minutes, is going to be me talking about mostly how we get the initial conditions and in particular the initial condition solver that we are planning to make public soon. And then Katie will talk how we apply this code to study inflation and in particular homogeneous inflation. So the recipe for studying some numerical GR problem in cosmology, the first thing is we need some evolution code. As you know, we have to formulate GR as an initial value problem. What this means is we have to put some initial data and then evolve it with some evolution equations. So people have been talking about different codes in this conference already, and the code we are going to be using is GR Chombo. Of course, once we have the problem set up as an initial value problem, we need the initial conditions which is where I'm going to be focusing most part of my talk. We need to find and choose the right ones. And what this means is that we are uh, coding, we are working on an initial condition solver to solve the Hamiltonian and momentum constraints. And this is not something new. So there has been people already working on this. For example, Eloisa has some uh, paper working on initial condition solver with a multi-grid approach with Janssen toolkit. And then lastly, Katie will talk about inflation and what the results we got. So the first part, right, the pollution code is formulating GR as an initial value problem. As you all probably know already, we are going to slice the space time in uh, space like hyper slices, which will then evolve in time, as you see here on the right hand side. So the standard decomposition, decomposition we're going to use is a three plus one decomposition or the ADM decomposition in which we are going to slice the space time with three metric, and then the labs and the shift, which are going to be dynamical gauge variables. Just to make some comparison with standard homogeneous cosmology, we are also going to have the strange curvature here, which is approximately derivative with time of the free metric, and includes the information about how this hyperslice is embedded into the full dimensional space time, the four dimensional space time or the expansion here, which is its trace. And this in FRW, for example, will correspond to the Hubble parameter. So if we project the equations into the hyperslice and the orthogonal direction, we are going to get some evolution equations, which are very complicated. And we probably all of us know this, but we don't remember them. So yes, but they are quite difficult. But once we have that, for the gravitational sector, we can also choose for the matter, matter sector depending on what we want to study. So if we want to study black holes, this would be in principle the easiest case in which we don't have energy momentum tensor and the only equations we need to solve are the gravitational sector uh, equations. But if we want to study some matter field as a scalar field for inflation, we need to choose some energy momentum tensor and then of course solve also, in addition to the GR equations, also solve the uh, equations of motion for, for the scalar field. So here I'm showing some the phase space. I'm, I'm talking here about the simplified phase space because I'm only writing the field velocity, the field and the free metric. But in principle, there are many more variables as the strange curvature tensor. But once we have the problem as an initial value problem, we should be able to just choose some uh, initial conditions here. And then the evolution equations will draw a path in the phase space. But as we will see later, this choice of initial conditions cannot be randomly chosen. We need to satisfy some conditions. And this is where we talk about initial conditions, right? We have to find and choose the right ones. So when we split this three plus one in this three plus one decomposition, in addition to the evolution equations, we also get four constraint equations, right? Hamiltonian constraint here, the first one, and three momentum constraints. Well, the first part is the gravitational quantities, and then the rho and the SI correspond to the matter field, so the energy density and the momentum density. And the standard approach is that, one, we will specify the energy density and momentum density, and then solve for the gravitational part, as we will see later. But the, the key thing here is that if what we are studying, we want it to be a GR solution, 
we need these constraints to be satisfied at all times. Right? We need h to be zero and the momentum of change also to be zero. And if you see here, there is no time dependence, not at least explicit time dependence. So if you specify some initial data that satisfies these constraints, this should be satisfied at all times. So the picture in the phase space now changes a bit. So instead of randomly choosing some configuration here, we are going to have some constraint surface where these constraints are satisfied. And then when we study problems in cosmology, we have to make sure that, first of all, the initial data we choose is on this surface. And then also that during the evolution, it remains on the constraint surface. So if we choose something that is off constraint or something that is initially in the constraint surface, it satisfies the momentum and Hamiltonian constraints, but then it goes off constraint, we cannot trust our simulations. So, and we should look at maybe the initial conditions were not right, or maybe the evolution code is not right. But, so to solve this, as I, I said, we are working on an initial condition solver with year Chombo. We are trying to make it as general as possible, so that you just have to include some the matter field you want. We are also using multiple methods to solve it. And the idea is making it in a way such that you can just run it you're going to get some file for the initial condition and then evolve it with any code you, you would like. So the standard approach we are using is, OK, so we solve these four constraints here, where, as I said, rho and SI are different projections of the energy momentum tensor. We are going to choose a conformal ansatz in which we are going to decompose the three metric as a conformal factor times some conformal metric. And we are going to also decompose the string curvature tensor in its trace and traces parts. So if we expand these four equations here with these assumptions here, we get a nonlinear system of elliptic PDs. So the first one being the Hamiltonian constraint here, where you see that now that equation reduced to some Poisson equation for, for the conformal factor. Here we have the Ricci scalar of the three metric and other terms regarding the related to the gravitational sector and other ones in the matter field. And also similarly for the momentum constraints. We can even decompose this even further using the conformal transfer traceless decomposition in which we decompose the strategic curvature tensor as a transfer traceless and a longitudinal part. And then the equations are written as follows here. So the only thing I want you to focus here or keep in mind is that we have some choices that we're going to make, and this would, in principle, be the inputs in the code. For example, the three metric, right? We can choose it, for example, conformally flat, and all this will simplify. For example, the rich scalar will vanish. But the idea is making this general so that you can choose whatever you would like. Then the expansion, the transfer traces, extrinsic curvature, the energy density, and the momentum flux. So once, in principle, you set or you choose these quantities here, you then would need to solve for the conformal factor and the uh, AIJ, the strength curvature, the longitudinal component of the strength curvature. So just to give you like a sketch of how we solve this system of nonlinear PDEs. So here I'm showing an example of a nonlinear PDE, right, which you have here for some quantity psi. You have some power of psi, and then some c, which is some source, which will, in principle, depend on, on the space. So the way we solve this system of non or this equation of this PDE that is nonlinear is we first linearize. Um, so we are kind of expanding around some background value, which would be the case that you, you put in the in the solution. If you expand the equation above, of if you linearize it, you will get some Laplace operator acting on this deep side. And then a linear term where now everything is linear and you only get this this deep side and then this nonlinear uh, sorry uh, just the constant or it just depends on the on the space. You're missing a term, by the way. You're Am missing, I? E, yeah, D square sine term. Oh, sorry, here, here, there's another yeah, one. Here, yeah, 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 there is another one, sorry. 
yeah. But once you simplify this equation like this, uh, you can just solve for deep side using linear multigrid methods and construct the new psi from the old psi zero as this solution that you got. And then you can just iterate a couple of times until you see that the deep side that you have been getting is close to zero, where you see that then your psi new is converging to some value and then construct the psi final, your final solution. So for the inflationary case that we are studying, then we can specify what the energy momentum tensor is with these usual terms, and then compute just what the energy uh, the energy density is, where we are going to have some gradient term, kinetic term, and potential term, and the momentum flux. And as you see here, depending what configuration you choose with phi dot or with the gradients, if you put some velocity in the field or some gradients, you will need to solve the Hamiltonian constraint or both the Hamiltonian constraint and the uh, momentum constraints. And this is where Katie will proceed. Sure. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Yosu. Uh, I have to work out how to share my screen now. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. Um, okay, so Yosu told you about, about what we were doing with the initial condition solver, but I wanted to give an, a kind of explanation of, of why we were bothering to do this, because I'm sure for a lot of the problems that people are working on here, you don't need such a general set of uh, initial conditions. Um, but for the specific problem that we're interested in, um, we we would really like to be able to have the most general possible solution. Um, and so I'll try and explain a bit why that is. So what we're really interested in um, is how inflation actually got started. Um, so we know that inflation solves the horizon of flatness problems and that it gives us the right kind of spectrum of, of fluctuations that we observe in the CMB. Um, and so it's very successful in that sense. But then, um, you know, you see these pictures of, of inflation and, and the expansion of the universe, and they have this kind of bright light at the beginning. Um, that's a sort of bright, blinding bright light that we can't really look at. And, and there's, it reminds me of this cartoon that, that's, um, you know, you should be a bit more explicit here in step two. This is some kind of miracle that, that allows us to get um, inflation started. Um, so just to make that a bit more explicit what the problem is um we're often like this is how we learn uh about inflation when we do our undergraduate cosmology course um we're told that okay at some point you had a scalar field that was on a hill and it starts to slowly roll down the hill um so the picture you have in mind is is this is the potential that the scalar field is subject to and this is the physical space so actually, you only have a single value of the field, and everywhere in space has the same value of the field at this point. Um, and since everything is, um, sorry, let me just move pictures of people. Um, so since everything is uh, is homogeneous, um, the expressions for the the energy density and the pressure, you lose these gradient terms, or you also lose the phi dot terms because it's slowly rolling. Um, and so this gives you the right equation of state to be able to have a, an inflationary period. Um, and so the field slowly rolls down the hill and at some point it ends up in the, the minimum and you have reheating. Um, but of course, if you really want inflation to solve the horizon problem, then what you really have in mind is that at the initial time, you actually have a fairly complicated set of initial conditions. So not only are these terms non-negligible, non potentially, but you also, if you have large perturbations in the scalar field, you'll also have large perturbations in the metric sector as well. So potentially things are much more complicated and it's not obvious in this situation that inflation can actually get started in the first place. Um, so this is, this is referred to as the initial condition problem for inflation. Um, and I like to see it in this kind of flow chart where you say, okay, let's assume that space time and the field are homogeneous before inflation. Well, then, okay, you don't need inflation, at least for the horizon problem. Okay, you might want it for other reasons. Um, well, okay, then, then things must be inhomogeneous before inflation. But then you come to the conclusion that potentially inflation cannot have got started. 
And there are quite a few, um, this is quite a controversial subject, I think at the moment, um, and there are a few possible reactions you can have to this, this problem, um, which I've tried to summarize here. I think the main one is, um, well, we should only consider inflationary models that are robust to inhomogeneities. Um, and there are some models that are more robust than others to having these very general initial conditions. Um, the slightly more sort of aggressive response is, well, we should throw away inflation and find something that works better. Um, and another potential response is, well, okay, maybe, you know, whatever quantum gravity mass we have at the beginning actually just gives us something that's homogeneous in the first place. So maybe we don't need inflation. Maybe we should try and explain why things are homogeneous just from sort of first principles of quantum gravity. But obviously that's, that's quite a difficult problem to attack. So, um, so what do we mean by a, an inflationary model being robust? Um, we generally understand it as um, having a slow roll being an attractor in the phase space of initial conditions. So like Yosu was showing you earlier for the, the sort of starting your initial conditions and then evolving them um, in the phase space, what we want is that wherever we start in this phase space, we hope that it always sort of ends up in this regime where phi dot is small and where phi is in the inflationary part of the potential. Um, so that's that's what people usually understand by the term of robustness. And there's a, there's a good review um, by Robert Brandenburger on the topic. Um, but again, you know, this is not just so simple as having just simple values here. You know, this is the phase space is really infinite. You know, this is this is a a configuration on the initial slice, not just a single value. Um, and also, you know, your metric again comes in and your time derivative of your, your metric for the initial conditions. Um, so so this space is, is obviously huge. You also kind of have this, this model space. I mean, we don't think of a model space as being part of the initial phase space, um, but we really do also have a, a kind of model space of of initial con of um, inflationary models, so like a, a concave potential or a, a sorry convex potential or a concave potential, um, and this also you know you can tweak this as much as you want. So you can kind of always put in fancy things to your model that will make it survive some set of initial conditions, um, but it's not clear to what extent you're going to accept um, that sort of baroqueness in your in your inflationary model. So, so obviously this, this problem of seeing whether um, initial conditions are end up in the slow roll regime um, is quite hard to do analytically once you have these very general initial conditions. And so it's a really great problem um, for numerical relativity, which you know, is, is, is exactly designed to look at these kind of big perturbations and seeing if, if you know, set up initial conditions and see what happens. Um, but having said, um, having told you that the, the sort of the initial space is infinite and the model space is infinite, it might seem like this is kind of a hopeless problem where, you know, you've got far too many potential parameters that you could tweak. Um, but what we found when we're studying it is that it's actually quite, um, quite easy to look at classes of models and classes of initial conditions and make kind of general statements about um, about the, the robustness or the behavior of those particular models or those particular classes of initial conditions. Um, and so in particular relevant to this talk is we can generally um, class our initial conditions as having scalar vector or tensor perturbations um, defined in this way. So I mean, these are not the ones that you get from perturbation theory. They will mix because um, you know this is not a linear order. Um, but uh, generally, you can say, OK, something where the initial field profile is non-trivial, but the field derivative, the time derivative is zero. Then if you think back to the Hamiltonian momentum constraints, you have the Hamiltonian constraint you need to solve is, is non-trivial, um, but the momentum constraint is, is trivially solved. Um, whereas if you want to do something more general, you actually need to put in a non-trivial phi dot. This will give you a non-trivial momentum density, and so you're going to have to solve all four, four equations. Um, and that's kind of the motivation for why we want to write this most general initial condition solver 
to be able to tackle this second case. Um, so there's a third case, which we've also looked at, where we put in these kind of gravitational wave type perturbations that aren't sourced by the scalar field. Um, and that actually turns out to be fairly easy to do. Um, but yeah, the sort of the, the real one that we want to get to is this, this sort of vector perturbation space, which for which we need the general uh, solver. So um, I just wanted to highlight that there's a lot of work that's been done previously on this problem of the initial condition for inflation and actually a parallel set of work that's been done looking at bouncing scenario. Which is also a kind of early works, sort of starting uh, with this one with Goldworth and Perrin um, in the uh, 1990s, um, and then um, kind of revived um, by this paper by, by William East um, in 2016. But yeah, this, this is the, the work that we've done um, on the topic. And um, so I, I don't know how much time I have left, probably about. Uh, about 30 seconds, but that's fine. Go on. <laughs> okay. okay. I, I, I'm really just going to sort of give you our main result and then, yeah. and then finish. Sounds so, perfect. Go for it. Can't wait. Um, so yeah, so, so one of the things that we were really looking at was this small field inflation where this, um, this sort of distance along the inflationary plateau is quite short relative to the, the Planck scale. Um, and these models turn out to be not very robust. So um, I'll just show you the sort of the movie. Um, so you start with your profile of the field being quite general and you have these oscillations and at some point it settles down. And so now you are in a, a, a regime where you're inflating, slowly rolling down the hill um, and this will go on for a certain time. But at some point these, these points um, will be too far down the hill and they'll, they'll fall down um, into the reheating minimum. And that's basically game over at that point. So once one point goes down, what we found is that the rest of the space time is, is immediately, well, immediately or within a few e-folds is also dragged down. So however much inflation you've got at that point, that's basically all you're gonna get. So what we find is that even for very subdominant scalar perturbations, this sort of ratio relative to the scale of inflation of 10 to the minus four, we're getting you know around 10 e-folds which isn't really enough so um so anything above this level is going to break inflation um and you can easily kind of understand this when you look at the simulation you can see it's very wave-like um so you have this this gradient pressure which is wanting to kind of pull the field flat um and opposing that is the potential gradient which is pulling you down the hill towards the reheating minimum and so you can actually write quite specific conditions for when these two effects are going to, to balance each other. And that's the kind of critical point at which um, this model is going to fail with these kind of perturbations. Um, and so um, this paper, I, re I recommend the YouTube link, especially that Yosu has, has done this amazing video that summarizes all of the, the models and how robust they are um, to perturbations. Um, but our general finding is that convex models like this one, like M squared phi squared, are much more robust um, than concave ones, simply because as you can see, as you get further down, actually the, the potential gradient gets less, whereas for concave models, it actually gets steeper. So as the, as the perturbation gets a bit bigger, you're, you're really sort of, you're, things just get worse for you um, in the, these models. Whereas here, things actually get kind of better in terms of there's less force pulling you down the hill. Okay, yeah, I'll stop there and leave my conclusions up. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Katie and Yasu. I'll just stop the stream. Yeah, that's fine. And we're live. Julian, take it away. All right, thanks a lot. So um, in this presentation, I want to talk about uh, another code for um, relativistic simulations. It's called Evolution. I'm uh, its main developer. And I uh, subtitled it with, it's a precision tool for weak field uh, general relativity. And uh, I'm gonna explain a little bit um, what I mean by this. So uh, let's dive right in. 
So, um, so I think the numerical challenge I have in mind is that uh, we um, uh, want a code uh, for uh, yeah um, simulations of large scale structure uh, that is really um, able to um, be used uh, for for in the context of upcoming surveys where you have uh, huge amounts of data and you can really look at very small effects. So um, you might be, you will be able to test gravity on very large scales. Um, uh, this is data from Euclid, LSST, and so on. And uh, so we need really some some uh, some practical tool um, because um, right. So so we have seen a lot of amazing talks uh, about about um, numerical GR codes, mm -hmm. but uh, even though they are also very precise, maybe more precise even uh, than than the code I'm going to, going to talk about in terms of how they how well they uh, solve Einstein equations. Um, uh, there, are, there are a couple of things that you also want to have. So f first of all, um, I think one of the main prerequisites to be useful at all is that you want a fully nonlinear evolution of matter. So uh, what, what I mean with, with this is that you, that you really want to probe the uh, regime of structure formation, so formation of halos, hierarchical structure. And, and for this, um, I would argue that at least to our uh, current um, technological knowledge, let's say, the n-body method is probably best suited. Uh, we've seen that there is, uh, that you can also use fluid methods, but these will um, will only work on large scales where you have single stream uh, evolution, more or less. And once you want to have really com complicated structure formation, uh, yeah, the, these methods will just um, be at the end of their the, the capabilities. Um, then uh, next point is that, uh, I mean, since we want to do relativistic effects, we want to solve consistently the evolution of the geometry. So this is really something um, that, that uh, G-evolution, all our codes uh, bring new to the game because, because of course, um, uh, we have all these Newtonian codes that have been around for a very long time, very successful, uh, and they, they do solve um, only to some degree consistently the, the, the GR problem. So they, they only are in the Newtonian limit. Uh, it's it's a good approximation in some regimes, but but it doesn't get the whole picture. So so we really want to complete this picture, right? Um, that's the next point. Another um, thing, and this is really what what we've been uh, working on in the last uh, years, and we'll have a couple of talks later this afternoon um, talking more about this, is uh, if you run such a simulation, you will get, well, a four-dimensional um, uh, numerical solution to the problem. And now you want to actually extract something meaningful out of it. You have to map the simulations to actual observables. And this is also an interesting problem, um, which can be solved, for instance, with ray tracing. And uh, it's really uh, that uh, if you if you if you take that say just the data on a hypersurface, and then you can, for instance, compute power spectra and so on. Uh, this is not yet uh, a true observable. So there are effects coming from how we observe actually the configuration of our uh, universe uh, that that you would miss. And and to actually do this properly uh, is an interesting problem in a, in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> Finally, um, I think it's also important to keep in mind that with the precision that we have nowadays, uh, it, it's not enough to have just dark matter only simulations, right? So we are we are sensitive to a lot of small effects um, with our upcoming observations, and we want to be able to model them as well, because otherwise um, it's, it's going to be difficult to actually disentangle like to do really a serious tests of gravity, if you have other small effects that are maybe the same order that you haven't modeled properly. So there, you know, I've got like a non non um, uh, exhaustive list of, of things. So for instance, small scale phenomena, astrophysics, uh, this is something that is not included in evolution and it's probably not gonna be included anytime soon. Uh, the reason is that we are gonna look at large scales on. So this is a difficult problem that other people are working on and it's it's really it's a whole other kind of worm so i'm not gonna gonna open here 
uh, what is interesting for large scales is uh, cosmic neutrinos in relativistic species because they have large free streaming lengths, they develop, they will affect large scales. And, um, and this, uh, this is actually fully incorporated already in the public version of the code. And uh, other things to think about is, for instance, dark, uh, dynamical dark energy. So if you if, if you go away from the lambda CDN paradigm, you replace lambda by something else, uh, by a dynamic field, maybe with perturbations. Um, this can also have effect uh, on, on large scales. And uh, we've made some good progress uh, looking at this, and we are going to uh, proceed along this line and then <coughs> try to incorporate more. Um, ways of, of um, dealing, dealing with this question. And in the end, in order to actually uh, do big simulations that are really useful uh, with, with enough, let's say, uh, numerical conversions and everything, uh, you need to ha ha uh, have a code that uh, also has a competitive performance. So you have to be able to scale it up to trillions of particles if it's necessary, right? <clears throat> OK, so this is more or less the, the numerical challenge that uh, that we are trying to solve, uh, and uh, we started this um, uh, way back in 2015 when the code was first uh, released. Uh, actually, the paper came out in 2016. Uh, uh, these are the original people I started to work with: so David Averio, Paul Dura, and Martin Kunz, the all in Geneva at the time, uh, and. It's been public since uh, since the beginning. Uh, now it's version 1.2. You can get it from this uh, Git repository, and I've just put this nice uh, uh, title page of the of that edition of Nature, where they, they also like to say it's a universal code. This is exactly what we have in mind. We want something that that includes all the relevant physical aspects uh, on large scales to do uh, simulations. All right. So, um, so how do we uh, do it in more detail? What is the what is the framework, um, the theoretical framework? Uh, and here I want to make the connection to the um, uh, talks that we have already heard. Uh, so we've seen this just in the talk before and also uh, yesterday. Um, you, you start with this ADM decomposition, right? So you do a three plus one split of space time, and you can write down an exact. Uh, metric like this, where you have a lapse function, a shift vector, and, uh, and a spatial, uh, like this, a three dimensional spatial metric. And um, in our framework, we choose Poisson gauge variables. So, what this means is that we, that we uh, rename this alpha as scale factor times e to the phi, uh, uh, chi, sorry. This beta we rename scale factor squared times the other variable b. And then the um, space uh, like metric is scale factor squared and e to the minus two phi, and then just a diagonal matrix plus a small perturbation. <coughs> so um, there has been a bunch of uh, we had we had already some discussion uh, last week with Haley. I was asking about this: uh, what, what is the significance of the scale factor here? Are we assuming? Uh, that we are perturbing around the background. And um, yes and no, I would say. So the exact form of this scale factor, uh, what you put in here, is not relevant. As you, as you can see, um, you could redefine the scale factor with some other function and still get the same alpha, beta, and gamma uh, by also changing phi, b, and uh, phi, uh, psi and phi, right, by, by the same amount. So there, there is a, a so, so this is really kind of a, uh, a redundant variable if you want, and the reason we just put it is uh, to uh, to make the connection to the usual um, cosmological uh, perturbations here, right? So you can put, so we actually don't, uh, we, we actually put an own function here. So we say we are using some fiducial scale factor here, and plug this into our equations. But the actual um, constraints will be solved consistently so that whatever the space time does that is different from from this solution that we plug in here will be will be uh, represented in, in, in corrections to these to these variables. So in this sense, I would say it is still background free, right? <clears throat> and uh, the point is that uh, at least initially we know uh, that these variables 
um, are, are small. So we are in the weak field regime when we are look at, looking at this CMB. And we can quantify this. Uh, let me just to, to convince you, show you the power spectra that, uh, of these variables. So um, this is for three different redshifts, redshift three, one, and zero. Um, and if you look just at the, at the dashed line, that's this linear perturbation theory here for, for one of the metric potentials. This is all under the M, of course, right? So the, the, metric, the, the scalar metric potential, the Newtonian one, is by far the, the largest one, and it's 10 to the minus 5, roughly. So because 10 to the minus 10 in the power spectrum, which is a quadratic quantity. Um, the next largest one um, is the gravitomagnetic potential, and this is, appears in perturbation theory only at second order. So if you do a second order perturbative calculation, you get this answer, this power spectrum here, right? And it is about, um, in, in, in terms of power spectrum, it's about four orders of magnitude smaller, uh, which means it's like less than 1% roughly then uh, compared to the, to the uh, Newtonian potential. And then if you look at the difference of the potentials, which is the gravitational slip, or the um, this HHA, which is the spin two field, uh, or the gravitational waves, this is even smaller, right? So this is way down here, like uh, many, many orders of magnitude smaller than the uh, Newtonian potential, which itself is a 10 to the minus five, as I said, right? Um, <clears throat> so so uh, from perturbation theory, uh, this, this motivates really well uh, the idea that we can expand uh, using this as, as kind of small parameters and we weak field expansion. We don't have to make an assumption about stress energy. We just say the gravitational fields in reality are, are weak in cosmology. And just uh, to, to uh, explain what the colored curves, so these are the nonlinear. If you do the actual simulations, um, you see that you get a little bit of a nonlinear enhancement, of course, uh, if you do the full, full calculation. All right. So um, uh, with this in mind, uh, we, we go back to the, we plug in this, um, this ADM metric into the Einstein's equation, and we do uh, this weak field expansion. So what, what I mean by this is that we more or less, uh, for the very small quantities, for the B and for the HIJ, and for the Xi, which is a uh, new variable uh, for phi minus Xi, um, for these, we linearize everything. So we say, uh, because we know that they are anyway much smaller than the gravitational potential, uh, we can linearize. And only for the gravitational potential itself, um, we keep terms. So if you look at, for instance, this term, the Laplacian of phi, it, this is in, in the Newtonian theory would be proportional to the density contrast. And the density contrast we know can become large. So this, because there are two spatial derivatives, this can become large. So this is why we actually want to keep this term, right? Because it is multiplying a large term. So uh, there's kind of a, a good a reason to keep um, keep the second order term here. And the same here, this is more, more or less for the same reason this here. And um, uh, then we use uh, projection operators written here to kind of project out, um, for instance, the vector part of the momentum constraint, which then gives you the, the uh, shift, or uh, in the, um, can you project out the tensor part, which gives you an, an evolution equation, essentially, for the, for the gravitational wave. And just see how I'm doing this time. All right. <clears throat> So, um, so this is exactly the equations that we solve. The, the, the right hand side is uh, computed, for instance, uh, directly from the n body ensemble, also in a relativistic um, uh, way. So, uh, this is really a non perturbative right hand side. And, and uh, we, we have to keep these quadratic terms here because if you, if you move towards the large scales where it's non perturbative. Uh, source term here is more or less given by its second order term. You have to include all second order terms, right? So you have to include this one as well. Otherwise, it's not consistent. This is why uh, we do this kind of expansion up to, up to the second order in, in the uh, gradients. All right. Um, so, so we solve this um, uh, 
equations and uh, we get a solution of, uh, um, of the space-time uh, metric uh, in, for the four-dimensional space-time. We have uh, the solution of the particle evolution. And uh, now comes this part where, where we uh, want to connect to observables. And uh, well, we do this by, by ray tracing. So we have, um, we output all our um, simulation data on the light cone. So we, in the beginning, we fix an observer. Uh, and, and we know in the background space time where the null hypersurface uh, of this back, uh, backwards light cone uh, lies. And whenever, let's say, a particle crosses this, um, this null hypersurface, we record it. And for the metric, we keep like a, a, a finite uh, space and region around the null hypersurface so that we can do ray tracing without any approximations. So with this data, we just then do shooting. We start from the observer, solve the geodesic equations, which I've written here, including only the frame dragging potential. In principle, you should also include the gravitational wave part, but because they are so small, for now we haven't uh, done it. It's, it just makes the equation a bit more cumbersome. It's not uh, conceptually more difficult, but uh, at the moment, we just, uh, we just include the frame dragging. And, uh, and then, okay, so you integrate these equations backwards in time uh, to let you have to specify some source uh, catalog. You can use, for instance, a um, uh, halo finder to, to find some halos on the light cone. And then uh, with the shooting method, you will see, okay, you, you shoot in the direction of the halo, you will slightly miss it because, uh, because your ray gets deflected. But uh, when you are at the closest approach, you know by how much you have missed it. So you kind of correct a little bit your shooting angle, shoot again, and then you just iterate until you converge. And this will give you um, the observed position of that halo. And then, of course, once you know the knowledge you desk, you can, you can also uh, compute the observed redshift, observed angular diameter distance along the light ray, and so on. <coughs> So if we apply this in a big simulation, and this is like one of the first things we did, uh, we can construct a, um, a synthetic Hubble diagram. So here you can see the observed luminosity distance for a halo catalog uh, between uh, Regis 0 and Regis 3 with a couple of million halos, I think 10 million roughly. Um, and uh, we show here the deviation from the fiducial uh, background one. So you can really see there's a large scatter. Initially, you even see that there is a little bit of a local if you would zoom in a little bit, you can see that there is a kind of a, some local inhomogeneities that you can see here. But then uh, as you go far out, it more or less becomes just like a broad uh, distribution. And uh, so there are a few things uh, that you can see here. For instance, you see that uh, you will have like, it's much broader towards down here. And there's much lo longer tail of the distribution uh, towards um, lower luminosity distance, which means you have a few strongly mag magnified sources, which you don't have in the other direction. And this is because uh, demagnification, so you get demagnified by voids, and voids cannot become arbitrarily empty. But over densities can become arbitrarily over dense. So there, there's this asymmetry that you can see here. And um, so it makes it kind of non uh, like a skewed a skewed uh, distribution and because it's a skewed distribution um if you take averages uh let's say of a non-linear function of the luminosity distance it depends on what kind of function you're averaging over right so so you can average over the luminosity distance itself or the square of it or you take the log of it, which is then the, the uh, mu, or you take one. If you take the flux, which is one over the luminosity distance squared, and you see if you just average these functions, you average, uh, yeah, you will get different answers. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, the one that is closest to the, I mean, at least from this set of examples, the one that is close to the to the background is if you average over the flux. Um, and then there's a good physical reason for this, why, why this should work best. Um, 
you can you can also use this distribution and see okay if I if I would then do an NCMC and ask what is what is what kind of cosmology do I infer from from this data? Uh, if you look, for instance, in the omega k omega matchup play, um, it's just just use the data and uh, and uh, um, let's say a uh, Gaussian uh, likelihood model, you will get these kind of constraints and. Um, and they, as you can see, they are all biased. They will all measure some curvature that is not really there in the universe. And that's basically because uh, the Gaussian likelihood model that we use here uh, doesn't capture the, the structure of this, this scatter well, right? So what you then can do in order to fix this, you kind of bin the data. You say, okay, let me just make use of the central limit theorem. I just take uh, a, a thousand data points and average like over them, and then uh, that the mean of those will be more Gaussian distributed. And then you do, then you reanalyze the data, you blow up a little bit your constraints, and then you see it still depends on which uh, quantity you actually average. So if you, for instance, average the the distance modulus, you will still be biased. But if you average the flux, uh, you end up with an unbiased uh, constraint. So this was all explained in this paper here. All right, I think um, that's the result I wanted to show. I'm, I'm now at the end, and let me just summarize a few of the things that I've, I've uh, shown. So in G-evolution, we do the scalar vector tensor decomposition, where we have two scalars, two vectors, two tensor decrease of freedom, which then resolves the equations for um, <coughs> uh, in the ADM. Well, uh, in, in this weak field, in this weak field uh, expanded uh, framework. Uh, I haven't really shown you, but uh, the, the particle uh, dynamics is also fully relativistic. Uh, so you can have uh, rel um, yeah, highly relativistic species as well, like for instance, neutrinos. Um, they are sort of consistently in the code um, because we use uh, this Poisson gauge uh, to to the calculation. Uh, we know in which gauge we are. And so large scale ga gauges are very transparent and also easy to connect to theoretical calculations that have been done in this gauge, kind of a more widely used gauge. For uh, now with the, with the public version 1.2, uh, we have this end to end pipeline uh, for the construction of observables, which means we. we can do the simulation and we can do ray tracing to actually uh, compute what an observer will see. And because uh, it's a relativistic framework, it's easy to go beyond cold dark matter only. So we include neutrinos and radiation already. Dark fluids are at the moment also included at the linear level. There's a version that, that will be going at the, to the nonlinear level as well, which is called K evolution. Uh, we are working on this at the moment. And, and um, yeah, on, on the dark energy front, there will be probably more work in the future. OK, I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Julian. Um, just let me stop the stream. live again all right thanks um so welcome back to the second half of the morning which will be uh showing some applications of evolution so that's why we set it up in this way um so um we'll have two um people um i've also been collaborating with the so first is francesca lepori and uh, and after that we'll have um carol um I, I never know how to pronounce the last name, sorry. It's Gwendolyn. <laughs> Gwendolyn, good, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, let's start with uh, weak lensing observables uh, from relativistic end body simulations. Take it away, Francesca. Thanks, Julian. So as you mentioned, I will be talking about an application of the framework that Julian discussed before. And uh, this is based on this publication and it's a working collaboration of these nice people here that you may know. And uh, the idea is uh, to explain how we can extract weak lensing observable from a simulation that you run with G-evolution. And uh, 
Okay, uh, my screen got frozen, so I think I will need to. Let me set this again. Do you see my screen? We can see you, that's all. Yeah, okay, I will share this again because for some reason, once you start the recording, it, I cannot switch slides anymore. Oh, okay. Okay, so I think I will just uh, do this way. Do you see now my slides? Yeah. Yes. And so, it will, my talk will be mainly divided in two parts. So in the first part, uh, I will explain a bit uh, of the ground and weak lensing, and in particular the perturbative formalism that uh, it's normally used to, to model weak lensing, and the link between this formalism and the method, the ray tracing method that is used in G evolution. And then in the second part, I will uh, just outline the main results of, of our work. So let's start from a scientific background uh, on weak lensing. So uh, we know that the shape and the size of the galaxy we observe are distorted through lensing by uh, the dark matter distribution along the line of sight. And in general, to see this, uh, this effect on individual sources is, is very difficult, it's not possible, but people realize that uh, in a, even in the regime where the lensing is, uh, is very weak, in the weak lensing regime, this effect can be detected as a, as, as a statistical signal. So by looking how the shape and the size of galaxies are, are correlated. And uh, this effect has been uh, first detected in uh, 2000, and now there are uh, many ongoing and uh, future plan surveys that uh, as weak lensing as one of the main targets uh, of, uh, of cosmology. And uh, the advantage of weak lensing is that uh, it's a complementary probe compared to galaxy clustering in the sense that it suffers from different systematics. In particular, lensing is sensitive to the dark matter distribution, so we don't have the problem of galaxy bias. However, there are other systematic effects that need to be taken into account and uh, to be studied in detail for uh, as an accurate uh, cosmological uh, estimation. And, uh, and it's very important for this purpose to use a numerical simulation. And in particular, it's, uh, it has been traditionally very important to control this systematics, in particular, increasing alignment. And in general, we know that uh, when we do parameter estimation in, from a galaxy survey, we need to estimate our observable very quickly. So there, is, there are a certain number of approximations that needs to be used, and uh, simulation are important to validate this approximation. And uh, third point, uh, when we look, for example, at observation of the Hubble diagrams from the supernova and so on, we know that lensing has an effect of, on this observation, and in particular introduces both a dispersion in our measurement and a systematic bias. And it's very important to, to model this effect uh, due to lensing, studying the probability distribution function of, of lensing. This is supposed to give some motivation. Okay. Uh, so let's start with the perturbative approach that is usually that uh, we normally use. So the idea is that uh, when we observe the angular position of a source, uh, the position that we observe is uh, uh, the, uh, the true position shifted by a certain uh, deflection angle. And uh, we can compute this deflection angle and relate it to the gradient of the gravitational potential. And uh, this is this relation here that I show in the slide. And uh, this, uh, this simple expression relies on a certain number of approximations. In particular, we need to assume that we only have a scalar degrees of freedom and uh, that uh, we can treat the gravitational potential linearly. And second point, we use the so-called Born approximation. So we assume that we can estimate the gravitational potential in this, uh, in this integral on the unperturbed geodesics. So let's assume that we, this, uh, this is reasonable and we can do it. So uh, what we want to compute is uh, the deformation matrix. that is the Jacobian between uh, the uh, image, uh, the, the, the angular position of the image, and the angular position of the source. And uh, under this approximation, you can relate this quantity to the second derivative of the gravitational potential. And uh, normally what people do is to parameterize this uh, deformation matrix, uh, separating the trace part of the matrix and the trace less uh, symmetric part of the matrix. So the, the trace part is called convergence, while uh, uh, the spin to object that uh, is extracted from uh, the trace less symmetric part is called shear. And uh, if you look at this expression, you note that you, we can know that uh, we have only one degree of freedom. So 
we have only the gravitational potential. And this means that convergence and shear are not independent. In particular, you can relate the angular power spectrum of the convergence to the angular power spectrum of the emotes of the shear. And up to a numerical factor, you can find that uh, these are equal. And the third point, under this assumption, we find that the deformation matrix is symmetric, so we don't have an, an anti-symmetric component. And uh, from this simple formalism, uh, this, uh, this formalism has been used to extract weak lensing observable from a Newtonian simulation. So what you can do is to separate the convergent, the trace part of this matrix, and you see that this is related to the Laplacian of the gravitational potential. And uh, once you do that, you can use a Poisson equation to relate the Laplacian of the gravitational potential to the density field. And we know that we can estimate the density field in full nonlinearities from a Newtonian simulation. So this way, we arrive at this expression for the convergence, and uh, you can just estimate the convergence discretizing this integral. So summing density maps weighted by this uh, weak lensing kernel, kernel along the line of sight. So let's say that we have an observer, we place uh, our simulation, we replicate our simulation box along the observer, and uh, we have these uh, concentric, concentric maps uh, of the density, and, uh, and we can estimate the convergence. So uh, as we said, this, uh, this has been done, for example, for the my simulation, and this is a plot of, of the lensing convergence from the simulation compared to the theoretical expectation. So the question is, uh, is possible to go beyond that? And if so, what happens? What do we expect to happen? So if we want to include correction beyond the Born approximation, we expect to have uh, an anti-symmetric part in our amplification matrix or the formation matrix. And, uh, and the shear bemodes will, uh, will not be zero. And uh, this can also be done with Newtonian simulation. And uh, what people do usually is to use a multi-less plane algorithm. So uh, you basically uh, split your line of sight uh, introducing uh, many lens planes, and uh, you apply the Born approximation only between two lens planes. And if you choose a number of planes that is large enough, uh, you basically are able to uh, recover in an accurate way this uh, post war correction. And so the, the, que the question that we want to, to address are why do we need to, to use a relativistic formalism? And here I just outlined uh, some, uh, some, motiva some extra motivation to go beyond the Newtonian approach. So first, as I will explain later, we will use a formalism that is purely geometric, so does not rely on a perturbative uh, formalism, let's say. And this can be used to check consistencies with results that have been obtained with the Newtonian simulation. And the uh, second point is uh, this framework is more flexible in a way that it's possible to uh, extend it to modify gravity theories in a consistent way. And then as motivation, we have uh, things that have been already discussed uh, in general when we talk about uh, relativistic simulation, we are interested in looking at uh, relativistic effects, in particular vector perturbation. And uh, since in, uh, we will deal only with observable quantities, uh, all that will be discussed will include naturally all the relativistic effects due to uh, yeah, all the relativistic effects. Okay, let me just uh, summarize how the ray tracing works in evolution. Already Julian uh, outline uh, said well, mostly everything. I will just stress which are the, the peculiarities of our, of our work. So uh, you need, first of all, to run a G-evolution simulation. And when you set your simulation, you, uh, you need to choose a position for your observer that generally is uh, the corner of your simulation box. And you have to uh, set a pencil beam. And uh, the way we, we set it for this simulation is to choose the, pen, the size of the pencil beam and, uh, and the center of the field of view in a way that it was possible to, uh, for the density beam to cross, again, the simulation box without any replication, at least at up to redshift 3.25. And, uh, and in this simulation, you need the light on output that Julian already described. You need to store the particles position on the light, their velocity, and, uh, and the metric perturbations. So once you have this output from the simulation, you need to post-process this output with a ray tracer. And the ray tracer has been developed by these people here, Julian, Chris, Louis, Ruth, and Martin. And, uh, and the idea is that to, to, to solve the geodesic equation, the one that uh, Julian showed is in his talk, that are formulated in a clever way, in such a way that, uh, just to remind you, it, this formulation is valid at all orders in the gravitational potential, while it assumes linear approximation for the vector modes, while uh, it's, uh, the, the tensor modes are, are neglected. And uh, so to integrate backward in time this uh, geodesic equation, uh, it's a shooting algorithm is used. Let me just uh, summarize here. So uh, the idea is if you choose the, uh, the initial guess for, uh, 
of uh, the direction of your uh, of your geodesic to be coincident to your target that can be an ILO of a particle and due to lensing you will not be able to uh, reach your target in your first case but you can correct iteration by iteration in a way that at a certain point you will be able to uh, to, to reach your uh, to reach your target and uh, we need the last ingredient as it was pointed out in the question so we need the geodesic equation and the geodesic deviation equation and to describe this, we use the geometric optic uh, formalism, the Sachs, uh, the Sachs formalism. So the idea is that uh, we have uh, the, our, our geodesic, and each, in each point of the geodesic, we, uh, we have uh, a tangent vector to ge the geodesic. And in each point, we can define a screen uh, and a basis on the screen. And uh, the basis of the screen is usually chosen to be a basis that is parallel transported along the, along the geodesic. And this basis is called the Sachs basis. And what you want to do is to find a mapping between uh, the observed, uh, the observed image of your source, and uh, and, the, and the physical shape of your source. And if you, in this framework, we, we will deal with uh, infinitesimal, infinitesimal like B. So in full generality, you can decompose this uh, this transformation in this way. So let's start from this observed image. Uh, the first operation is called the shear. And it's made in two steps. So you need first a rotation of your sex basis in a way that you are able to align your sex basis to the principal axis of your ellipsis. And once this uh, the basis is correctly aligned, you can change the ratio between uh, between the two axes, uh, preserving the area of the image. This is the so-called shear. Second step, you can uh, introduce a net rotation in uh, of your of your image. And third step, you just do a transformation that change the overall area of the image, preserving the ratio between uh, between the two, uh, between the preserving the ratio between uh, the principal axis. And uh, if you want to write this in a matrix uh, notation, this is what, what you get. Let me just stress that this first rotation of, uh, of an angle chi that you need to uh, align your sex basis to the principal axis. Is not per, is a not perturbative quantity, so it's arbitrary and depends on how you choose uh, your sex basis. And so the quantities that, that appear here are this uh, gamma and chi that describe the, the shear, this omega that is a net rotation, and this dA that describe the uh, amplification uh, of the of the area. This is called area distance. And then we can define the convergence as the fluctuation of this area distance compared to the average overall the whole angular position, and, uh, and the ellipticity that uh, will be a function of this uh, chi rotation and on this uh, gamma uh, transformation. So the ray tracer basically uh, computes evolution equation for this Jacobi mapping. And uh, in the Sachs formally, this Jacobi, this, uh, this evolution equation is, right, is written in terms of uh, this matrix S, that is a function of the optical scalar, uh, expansion and shear. Well, uh, the expansion is uh, basically the rate of expansion of the area of your image, where the shear is a rate of shrinking, let's say, of the area of your image. So the ray tracer solves first the Sachs equation for this theta and, and sigma, and uh, and then by taking by manipulating the equation for the Im imaginary and real part of the of this Jacobi matrix, you can find evolution equation for the area distance, the ellipticity, and this uh, rotation omega. Okay, let me just make a link between uh, this formalism and the one that I described at the beginning of this presentation. So we parameterize the Jacobi matrix this way in terms of area distance, rotation, and uh, these shear parameters. But in principle, we could have used a different parameterization that is closer to the perturbative one. So we can always decompose any metric in a trace path, in a traceless symmetric path, and in an anti-symmetric traceless path. However, when we want to, uh, the relation between these parameters here of this amplification matrix and the one that we introduced in the previous slide on the Jacobi matrix is, uh, is valid only at the linear level, in the sense that this kappa linear is equal to uh, the convergence that I defined, defined before only in linear theory. And uh, there is a unique correspondence also between uh, the shear gamma and the ellipticity that we defined before in linear theory. Well, in linear theory, we have the anti-symmetric part of this matrix uh, is zero. So uh, the reason why we choose to use this parameterization is just uh, it's, uh, it's more intuitive to give a physical interpretation to all the different uh, steps of the transformation. But uh, for practical purpose, in general, this physical interpretation is in the weakness regime is, uh, is, is valid and it's, uh, it can be used as well, just to 
just the, the relation is not exact in general. This is what I wanted to stress. Okay. Once this is set to done, let's move to, to the result part. So uh, we run a simulation, we run we post process a simulation with the ray tracer, and the result will be a, an allo catalog or a particle catalog. In our work, uh, we use uh, 135 million particles and the ratio distribution of these particles, the catalog is summarized here. And what the output of the ray tracer gives you is the physical position of your particles the velocity of your particles, the observed redshift, the observed angular position, the area distance, the ellipticity, and, and the net rotation of omega. So once we have this, uh, this catalog, what we do is to first select redshift beams. And uh, in our work, we, we use these five redshift beams that are outlined in color in this, uh, this plot. And uh, at each particle position, we compute the convergence for each particle in the beam. And uh, once this is done, we, uh, we split the redshift beam in pixel using uh, the, the pixel tool. And in each pixel, we estimate uh, the, the convergence, the ellipticity, and the rotation in the pixel by taking the average over all the particles that are in the pixel. And uh, this is enough to, to build your uh, convergence, ellipticity, and, uh, and rotation map. And if we want to extract the power spectrum, we need to do a spherical harmonical decomposition. And uh, this is a bit tricky in particular because uh, we, in our simulation, we cover a, a small fraction of the sky. And uh, the, uh, you need to correct your, uh, your estimator for the angular power spectrum to take into account of the mass. And to do that, there are uh, several codes. And the one that we use is uh, spice that has been uh, used, for example, for seeing, for seeing the analysis or for, uh, for other for weak lensing analysis. And uh, let's move to the results. Here I just uh, show the maps at redshift 1.5 for the convergence, the ellipticity amplitude, amplitude and, uh, and the rotation. And uh, we will go back uh, to see more in detail some of this map uh, later. And uh, so first test that we do to check the consistency with the Newtonian uh, simulation, with the result from Newtonian simulation, is to test the relation between the convergence and the e modes of the ellipticity or, or the shear. So we know that in linear theory, there is this relation between uh, the uh, ellipticity power spectrum and, uh, and the convergent power spectrum. And uh, in the high L limit, it means that the true power spectra must be uh, the same. In this plot here, I show on, on the top panel, in, uh, in orange, the convergent power spectrum estimated from our simulation. And uh, in green, the shear power spectrum estimated from uh, our simulation. And uh, a different redshift. And uh, in the bottom panel, we show the, uh, the difference, the, the relative difference between this, the two. And we see that uh, this relation is satisfied at the level of, of the 5%. And um, what I want to say, OK, we think that this 5% difference is probably due to the fact that uh, when, uh, when you extract the E modes of the ellipticity, there is some, uh, some leakage between the E modes and the B modes. And uh, there is a limited precision, let's say, when, uh, when we do the, uh, when we extract it. The, the angular power spectrum for a spin shoe object. Another thing that we notice here is that uh, there is, on uh, most cases, like multiples, there is a, a significant difference between uh, our result for both convergence and, uh, and shear and uh, the expected value from, uh, from linear theory corrected with allofit. And, um, and uh, we, we did several tests to say, to to study this, uh, but I don't have time really to explain. But what we found is that this was a consequence of the finite grid resolution on, uh, of, uh, of the simulation in evolution. Let's go on. We, uh, we studied then a second order effect. So we computed the uh, angular power spectrum for uh, the rotation omega. And we compare uh, these, uh, the results from our simulation with uh, the expected power spectrum from second order perturbation theory. And uh, in this plot, we show for, uh, for different redshift uh, with uh, data points, uh, the result from our simulation and with continuous line, what we expect from uh, perturbation theory. And we see that on large case, we have a, a good agreement between our simulation and, uh, and theory, while uh, as, uh, as we are as likely for the convergence at the shear, we have a small scale suppression of power that is due to, uh, to, the, to the finite resolution in, in G evolution. Uh, another note also related to the question that was uh, asked yesterday. So in principle, with all these formulas, we could aim to compute also the B modes of the ellipticity of the shear. Uh, 
the, the amplitude of this power spectrum is expected to be of the same order of the rotation power spectrum. However, uh, for uh, numerical reason, probably due to the to the finite uh, to, uh, to, 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 mas to masking effect, there was a, 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 we could not uh, extract the modes because it was dominated by numerical noise when, uh, when we tried that. Okay, second points we study the probability distribution function of our maps. And here I think I will have time only to discuss about the convergence. And in this plot, I show the uh, PDF of the convergence at different redshift. And uh, what we notice is that uh, first the distribution is non Gaussian for all, uh, for all the redshift and is actually asymmetrical. And, uh, and we compare the results from our simulation with uh, a fitting function that has been used and compare previously with the Newtonian simulation, in particular in this work, Takashi et al. And, uh, and what we find is that, uh, as it was fine for the simulation in Takashi et al., uh, the, the fitting function, this is sometimes used, underestimate the uh, PDF on uh, for large value of, of the convergence. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, in this case, we found a very good agreement with was what was previously found with Newtonian and body simulation. Let me skip maybe this part. Let me. We did a similar analysis also for the electricity and uh, for uh, the rotation angle, but uh, I don't have really time to discuss. And uh, one thing that I want to discuss is uh, the effect of the Born approximation. So uh, we wanted to see which is the effect of the Born approximation in the angular power spectrum at, at, at the level of, uh, of the mass. And uh, to do that, we use uh, two different retracer techniques to extract the convergent power spectrum. One is the fully geometrical one that I described before that does not rely on the Born approximation. And one is a ray tracer that is uh, currently a public, uh, public in, uh, in evolution that instead use the, uh, the Born approximation. And uh, these two different methods are, are like the yeah, orange and green. And we see that at the level of the angular power spectrum, the difference between the two is, uh, is extremely small. So it's not possible to, uh, to, dis to distinguish post-born effect in the convergent power spectrum. And yet I will show the difference that we find instead when we look at the map. It is, uh, it is clear. Uh, so on the left panel, I show the map of the convergence extracted within the Born approximation, while on the right, I have the map of the convergence in the full uh, ray tracing. And uh, this circle that you see here basically are uh, the highest uh, mass halos in our simulation. And uh, you will see that uh, redder, the, the, the color of the circle basically gives you information about the redshift. So the redder is the circle, I guess is the redshift of the halos. And uh, if we look at the exact result, so the full retracing one on the right, you see that the center of the halo is aligned with the maximum uh, of, of your convergence map. And if you compare this to, uh, to the left panel, instead you see that in the Born approximation, there is a misplacement between the center of the halo in front of, uh, of our convergence map and, and the peak of, um, of our convergence peaks. So this means that uh, it's possible to see at the map level some uh, uh, some effect of the wrong approximation. Basically, get the maximum point, the location of the maximum point of the convergence wrong due to the to, to the Born approximation. I think I hit over time, so I will just uh, move to the conclusion. So uh, a summary with basically computing and study uh, different aspects of uh, the witnessing of servos in G-evolution. And the main take-home message is that our results agree very well with the Newtonian simulation. And uh, it would be interesting in the future maybe to study more detail the effect of, uh, of the vector modes in, uh, in this simulation. And uh, again, yeah, we we'll stop here because I'm over time. All right, brilliant, thanks. And we're live again. Go ahead. All right. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Thanks. No, no, please. <laughs> Sorry. No, <that's> <laughs> go ahead. 
Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone, at least uh, here this morning. Um, I'm Carol, a PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo. And in these um, uh, 20 minutes, I'm going to present the work I've been doing in collaboration with uh, Julian, Phil, Chris, and Louis, uh, and Mary. And my advisor is Hawa Bremo. Uh, but first, uh, I would like to, to thank the organizers for this uh, very nice event and for giving us the opportunity to share our work with all of you. Um, okay, so I'm going to begin with uh, a motivations in the background first, and I'm going to start with uh, one of the primary uh, goals of future surveys, which is mapping inflation and seeing, uh, you know, the levels of Gaussianity of our initial conditions, how they truly are. Uh, so these levels of number of synergies, they mark the, the interactions happening during inflation, during a possible inflationary stage uh, with uh, you know, if you have multi-field uh, inflation, you can have a certain amount of non gaussianities present, which is imprinted uh, both on the CMB and on large-scale structure of the universe, and also uh, alternative scenarios to inflation, such as bouncing and periodic scenarios, can leave uh, different uh, amounts of non gaussianity uh, So this is uh, one of the one of the things that future surveys would like to constrain and the reason uh, why we can do that is because, because we can go to very large scales so we can uh, access this sort of information um, also uh, the cool thing about future galaxy surveys is that they, they give us a 3d map of the universe uh, in contrast with the 2d map that we have from the CMB. So the available degrees of freedom that we have there is much larger than in the case of the CMB. Uh, if we uh, model things properly, then we can make a very nice usage of the service to constrain things like that. And here I'm going to reference to uh, Captain's talk uh, for the you know, pre-inflationary uh, conditions. So if you guys want to, to re revisit this topic. Um, so one of the, the interesting features uh, from uh, non gaussianities is present in these uh, scale dependent bias that comes from uh, second order quadratic corrections to the gravitational potential. And these uh, quadratic corrections uh, gives these uh, k to the minus two scaling uh, on the bias of large scale structure tracers. Here uh, I'm showing uh, just to, to visualize how this affects the bias with, uh, with the scale that we are looking at. And for instance, this FNL of plus or minus 10, which is this uh, local shape of primordial non gaussianities it's already ruled out by the, the Planck uh, satellite, which gives these constraints for this particular shape of non gaussianities And uh, so uh, allow, uh, Probable uh, FNL uh, amplitudes are very small, and we need to go to very large scales in order to to see these things. So this is why it's uh, very important to go to these uh, large scales. And of course, um, I don't know how many of you know that, but uh, relativistic effects will have a similar um, uh, feature on large scales and will have a direct impact on large scales. So this thing uh, here that I'm showing is the, the, the observed, the truly observed uh, density contrast of large scale structure traces when we do it in the full GIS glory computing with all of the corrections that we, we have. I'm going to explain this a little bit further in my talk. Uh, so this uh, this redshift space, which is the thing that we observe in galaxy surveys, uh, density contrast, uh, if you compute the correlation function and the power spectrum of this thing, you're going to see that apart uh, in, in the multiples of the power spectrum, for example, uh, apart from the Newtonian uh, multiples, which is the one we compute from the standard Kaiser, uh, Kaiser formula, we have these corrections from relativistic effects and from primordial gas synergies. And one particular uh, feature of relativistic effects which, make, uh, which makes it a distinct feature uh, is the emergence of these imaginary uh, parts, uh, these imaginary uh, multiples. So we have the, the appearance of a dipole and an octopole. 
so because the the relativistic uh, correction which gives rise to this dipole carries a linear bias, this can also have an impact from homogeneal dosimeters. So in the case, uh, just to complement this and link with this scale dependent bias, uh, this that I'm showing here is the one over k square correction that appears uh, at second order in the monopole when you compute the spins consistently with uh, general relativity. And you can see that we have this behavior uh, at very large scales, which is much like what we see in the primordial non sanity scale-dependent bias case. So um, these things are somehow generated, these, these effects. And uh, this work here shows how uh, this can be, uh, this degeneracy can be broken if broken if we look at different redshift slices and particularly uh, in particular the quadrupole is going to suffer the most uh, uh, the contaminated signal is going to be the most contaminated signal from relativistic effects if we are, we are interested in looking at the primordial and gas energy stuff uh, but uh, <clears throat> apart from uh, so it is important to understand uh, these effects if we want to, to tackle relativistic effects, we must understand this primordial loss energy stuff. And if we want to constrain a primordial loss energy with future galaxy service we, via this scale dependent bias, we need to make a proper modeling of these relativistic effects. And But they are not just a source, uh, relativistic effects are not just a source uh, of contamination. They provide us insights and new observables into the large scale structure. Uh, in principle, we can use that to constrain the equivalence principle uh, on cosmological scales. And we can also uh, use it to, to constrain graph theories. Uh, this thing here that I'm showing is uh, it's from uh, this, this paper here by Camille Bonvin. And it's uh, representing the asymmetry that we have in the two-point correlation function of different types of traces due to the gravitational redshift uh, that we have. This is the most uh, straightforward relativistic effect that we can think about. So photons climbing up or falling down the gravitational potential is going to be redshift or, or blue shifted. And this uh, generates this asymmetry in the correlation function here, F1 and F2 are faint galaxies. Uh, and on the bottom of the gravitational potential, we have a bright galaxy. So by cross-correlating different traces, uh, Patrick McDonald has shown in his work that uh, we can have this uh, K to the minus one scaling in the power spectrum, which is much more easier to, to be observed uh, in the larger scales. So this is the two motivations that I wanted to to go through. And now, uh, some quick background. I'm going to talk about the Newtonian ratchet space distortions just for completeness. And in this Newtonian case, what we have is that we put by hand the, the, uh, the distortions in the uh, positions that galaxies would have in a perfect freedom elementary Hubbardson Walker uh, universe. So these perturbations comes from the peculiar velocities in the case of this uh, Newtonian standard Kaiser relative space distortions. And then the final positions uh, that we observe uh, of galaxies uh, is corrected by the projection of these peculiar velocities along the line of sight. Uh, so if we take linear theory and if we go to Fourier space, we can connect uh, the redshift space that's the contrast of some tracer alpha with the real space uh, dark matter uh, density contrast, which is related by the linear bias of these traces. Uh, the growth rate of structures uh, times this mu square factor. And we can see that even in the standard uh, Kaiser term, we have these imaginary piece appearing. Uh, but if you compute the power spectrum, this thing is going to be very suppressed. And this alpha here, it is uh, related to the sorry, to the selection function of your survey. So these have a, a, an impact on the imaginary piece uh, of the density contrast, but it is usually neglected uh, if you go to this distant observer approximation. 
Uh, now going to the, the relativistic corrections that we have in the, in the upper density of our traces. Uh, this, this piece here is the usual Kaiser term, but we also have a bunch of other corrections appearing. Uh, here I'm only showing the the line of sight. And uh, we can see that these relativistic corrections here uh, are going to, to depend on uh, particular parameters of our samples. Uh, this is the magnification bias of our galaxies, which is related to this, um, to this luminosity cut that we have in our survey. We have this term here, which uh, uh, give us the, the variation of the commuting number density of traces uh, with a uh, redshift. And if we go also assuming the uh, linear theory, if we go to Fouquet space, then we have this uh, this relation here between the redshift space uh, quantities with the real space matter over density. And it also has this uh, imaginary piece, which is characterized by these, uh, this dipole that appears. So uh, A alpha here is what I'm, I'm going to call Doppler term throughout my talk, and is, is given by these uh, terms into bracket. So if we compute the power spectrum, uh, the cross spectrum of two tracers, alpha and beta, then we can see that there will appear this mu squared, which carries this k to the minus two scaling, which is the thing that I showed in my previous slides. And we also have this dipole term, which is going to scale as a k to the minus one. And so this uh, quantity here, this imaginary dipole that we have, is going to be the main focus of this talk. And this is going to be the thing that I'm going to be uh, looking for in these devolution simulations. Uh, just a comment, uh, this, this uh, cross spectrum that I'm showing is in plain parallel approximation, where we take uh, the line of sights of, uh, of galaxies to be the same. Uh, we can do this beyond the plane parallel approximation, and in this case, we can we can see that even in the auto spectrum of trace of the same tracer, we have a uh, in a dipole term appearing, an, an imaginary part of the power spectrum. So this uh, raises complications to the analysis. So I'm going to be focused on this plane parallel thing uh, because we we have this uh, as you are going to see, we have this uh, very high red shift. Uh, simulation with a pencil plane survey, so I'm, I'm not worrying about things beyond the plane parallel approximation in, in this work. Uh, so just to, to give uh, you an idea of the amplitudes of these effects, this is the, the dipole uh, of both the power spectrum and the correlation function. So you can see that this is a very small scene and it has a very small amplitude. Uh, and does, this is going to be a challenge to be, to be I detected uh, the solid lines, which is the focus here, is the one assuming zero magnification bias. So forget about the rest. Uh, and this, uh, just to complement this uh, theory part, is showing the many other effects that you have because I'm only showing the Doppler term. Uh, but you have wide angle terms, you have potential term due to gravitational redshift, you have evolution and light cone effects, you have all sorts of complications. But they all have these. Uh, small amplitude as well, but you can see that these are, uh, for instance, wide angle terms is a very important thing to be modeled because it surpasses the signal that we are trying to measure. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the methods, uh, go through this simulation that we are using. And this is the, the light cone uh, that Francesca has mentioned in her, in her talk. Uh, this devolution simulation uh, has three different light cones. Uh, one, which is in a very uh, low redshift and with a very wide opening angle. We have an intermediate light cone going from redshift of 0.1 up to redshift 3, around 3. And we have a very deep uh, red, uh, light cone going up to redshift 7, but with a smaller opening angle. Uh, and we are going to stick to this intermediate, uh, to this intermediate light cone for our analysis. So here, what I'm showing is this intermediate redshift between 1.7 and 2.9 in redshift. So I consider this, this slice. 
uh, sorry, this is from the beginning of the column, sorry, um, this is wrong here. But this is the, this, the slide comb that we are considering and different colors different, uh, represent different uh, halos of different masses. Um, and here in the corner, I'm showing the difference between the observed redshift and the redshift that we have from the perfect uh, Hubble flow. So these effects are introduced by this ray tracing post-processing tool that uh, Julian discussed in his talk, which is this uh, sh shooting algorithm. So this thing consists of uh, several post-processing steps. We have the the uh, light cone that came out of uh, devolution. And this thing then is post-processed by this uh, ray tracing algorithm uh, after going through this uh, Rockstar Halo Finder. So uh, so this shifts the halos to the, to the observed positions that we would truly have in the sky. And this is uh, one slice of my redshift, which is a uh, one slice of redshift of my light cone that I, I'm considering in this analysis. It's going from 1.7 up to 2.1. Also, uh, different colors represent different halos. So uh, each color here, so the blue one represents this H naught sample. The orange one represents this H1 sample and the H2 represents the, is represented by these uh, red colors. So here I'm showing just, you know, a very small amount of payloads, so it, it does not get the whole the whole picture here filled by points. So we, we can visualize this thing. And this uh, on this table, I show the main character, the, the primary characteristics of these halos. So we consider three mass beams uh, described by these three samples here, and uh, three different redshifts. So from 1.9 up 2.3 and 2.7. So we have these three redshift slices. Uh, and we do this mass binning in such a way that we have the same number of halos in each beam. And uh, this bias here uh, was fitted from the correlation function monopole uh, for the real space halos. Uh, if you want, I can discuss this a little bit in more details uh, after, if you have any questions, but I'm not going to go through the details here. Uh, and this is the mean, the moving mean number density of halos at these effective uh, red shifts for, for these samples. Okay, so this is the, this is the, the things that we are going to use to try measuring that this dipole here. And as, uh, as you could see, uh, this Doppler term carries uh, the evolution bias. In our case, the magnification bias of dark matter halos is zero, so we don't have this term here but we do have the evolution bias. And despite we have the same number of halos inside each mass beam, uh, the evolution of these different, uh, different uh, halo populations, it's going to be different inside uh, each redshift beam, as you can see. So here I'm showing the moving number density of halos normalized by the total amount of halos inside the redshift beam. And as you can see, uh, so different, uh, the more massive uh, halo sample has a larger uh, slope here. Um, it's, it's more tilted within this uh, each redshift beam. And this is going to characterize the evolution bias because then we take the derivative of the swing with respect to the redshift and we can access the evolution bias which enters into our theoretical prediction. So I'm fitting, uh, I'm following this paper here by Gordon Voigtlid and Anaya Didio, uh, where they fit this linear uh, function to the, the mean number density. So this is uh, what I did. And once we do that, we can easily take the, the redshift derivative uh, of this number density to compute the evolution bias. So this is a straightforward thing to do. And we can see then the different evolution biases of our uh, halo samples inside each uh, redshift thing. So this is a thing which is important to put into the theoretical prediction, which is a dipole that we are trying to measure. So I'm going to go very briefly um, through the estimator that, uh, that we are using. Um, so uh, this estimator here, it, it uh, 
it is based on this local uh, power spectrum um, defined in a particular region of your survey uh, in order to do Fourier transforms of these things. So I'm going to go very briefly here, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so in order to compute these things using fast Fourier transforms and then doing this easily in the computer and very fast, we take the line of sight uh, of, of the galaxy uh, of the galaxy pair as the position of one particular uh, galaxy or halo in our case, which is this S1. And once we do that, you can see that it's very uh, easy to compute these things using uh, fast Fourier transforms. So uh, we do this for every piece of our survey of our light cone, and then we integrate over all possible line of sights. And this is going to give us this power spectrum within a particular beam. Uh, uh, a band, uh, in a particular bent power for case space, uh, which is the thing that I described it here. So let me skip this. So the estimator, the power spectrum estimator, are built from uh, from this expression here. So we can compute um, any uh, multiple that we want by computing the multiples uh, and correlating the particular multiple that we are interesting interested with the monopole of this overdensity field. So this overdensity field, uh, it is built a la Feldman, Kaiser, and Peacock uh, estimator, which uh, we subtract this random uh, halo, uh, this, this random catalog with random, uh, random objects following a Poisson distribution. And we subtract, we match the, the, the amplitude of this random catalog to the number of observed halos to build these over density fields so we can neglect things which are not the truly uh, cosmological uh, over densities. So here I'm just showing for, uh, so, so you can visualize the, the random catalog that we built from 10 to the 8 randomly uh, distributed uh, objects, which is much more dense than the real catalog that we have for, for our halos. And then we can compute, for instance, the dipole, uh, which is given by this expression here. Uh, here I show how you can build these uh, quantities, and this is a normalization factor that we use when we do this cross-correlation between uh, different samples. Uh, I'm neglecting uh, any sort of weighting scheme uh, in this analysis, just for simplicity. Uh, OK, so I'm going to go through the results now. Uh, hope I'm not too over time. Uh, so we have this problem, which is that we are considering uh, we are not working in a box. So if you take a anybody simulation and work within a box, this is fine. You don't have uh, things too many things to worry about. But in our case, we have this light cone here. So as you can see, the box is not completely filled by our by our halos. And this uh, particular uh, footprint, which is a characteristic of uh, general surveys, must be taken into account. So how we do that? We compute the, the same estimator here uh, that I'm showing. We compute this up to uh, the multiple moment of L equals 4 up to the exadecapole of our random catalogs, which characterizes the survey geometry. So this is going to put inside our estimates all the uh, geometric effects that we have from our selection function and our angular mask. So uh, this is just uh, showing uh, these multiples here from uh, the random catalogs. So how this is done, uh, I compute the uh, FFT estimator the, for the random catalogs, and I take this to configuration space. Uh, and once we do that, we can then convolve our theory following this uh, prescription here uh, for, the GIF, for the, all these uh, multiples. And by convolving this, we can transform these uh, convolved correlation functions back to Fourier space. And once we do that, then we can compare the theory with the thing that we measured, which has this uh, window function. The reason why we do that is because if you want to deconvolve the window function, it's a very tricky business. It's a very complicated integral and very costly to do. And also, we would try to gain information that we don't have, right? Because this uh, window function, uh, what it does is that uh, it expresses the laws of information that we have. So instead of trying to deal with that by gaining information, we try to do that by accounting these effects into the theoretical predictions. 
following these papers here. So this is the, the results that we have for the monopole. Uh, as you can see, uh, this uh, dot dashed line here uh, is the thing that I, I took from class. And as we can see, and, and the solid lines are the theory convolved with this window function. Uh, this is for the, the monopole of this first uh, redshift slice for all the halo samples that we have. And the error bars were computed from 100 log normal uh, simulations uh, with the same survey geometry, with the same evolution and linear biases of our halos. So uh, I generated these 100 log normal simulations, estimated them just as I'm estimating uh, the power spectrum of our real data. And then I took the, the variance of these 100 uh, samples to get these error bars. This is just a rough estimate to see how off we are going with respect to the theory. Uh, and this is for the, the monopole. And finally, for the dipole, what we have is that we could not detect this dipole thing. So um, here what I'm showing uh, is the dipole of the cross uh, obtained from the cross correlation of two traces alpha. In this case here, alpha is my first, my, my last massive halo sample, H naught, cross correlated with the other three samples. And I do this subtraction here. Uh, this uh, supposedly isolates the window function uh, impact on the dipole. Uh, isolating the relativistic contributions. So this thing that I'm sure because the, the, the Doppler term uh, dipole that we get from relativistic corrections is anti-symmetric. So this thing has twice the theoretical signal. So here I'm just going to show the completeness, the other uh, correlations that we have. Uh, so we cannot claim a detection. We are very limited in volume. And the estimator has this huge variance, so this is this was a problem. I'm not showing the other redshift slices because they are all the same and would, would not bring much information to this. So to conclude, we developed the machinery to really employed in galaxy service to deal with this. Um, so we included this uh, window function, survey geometry, and all of this stuff. But unfortunately, we could not detect the dipole in these 400 uh, degrees squared field due to volume limitations and a large variance of the estimator. And if you guys want to see this being detected in a ray traced Newtonian uh, simulation at low redshifts, you can look at this paper here for the Fourier space analysis and at this one for the configuration space analysis. Regarding these uh, no detection due to this volume limitation, this large variance, I would like to comment that the, the area that we have is similar to the final EBOS data release. So uh, for the cross correlation uh, between uh, two different traces, the area that they have is very similar to ours. So it's around 400 uh, square degrees. So it's something which is uh, our measurements are in the way of current surveys. So it's very difficult to measure. And other thing that we could do is go into this full sky case where wide angle effects should be included in order to a proper modeling uh, or we could also do these optimal weighting schemes, such as redshift weights, to enhance the signal, which increases with redshift. Or we could do this multi-tracer weight to beat cosmic variance somehow and to improve the estimator. So this combines in a very clever way different traces, which would be optimal for the detection of the dipole in not current but future service as well. So that's it. Thank you. Hope not went too fast. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, great talk.